Hi, everybody. I hope everybody has been enjoying the good food. I saw there was a run on the kale. That's got to be a, a good sign for the people who are cooking it, and uh, I suppose a good sign for our interest in our good health. Thank you, everybody, for coming to uh, another session of our Women in Leadership Forum, this one on women in academia, unmasking the complexities in rising to the top. Uh, this is uh, a topic that we have had uh, a great deal of demand for whenever we ask for, success, for suggestions of topics. This has been one that people have been thirsting for. So I hope that you'll really enjoy it. And we have a uh, tremendous panel for discussion today. Um, our Women in Leadership sessions are held three to four times a year, and my colleague Wendy Sukir and I sponsor these sessions. Wendy is off being a leading woman academic in China right now, which is why she's not here. Uh, so I get to uh, welcome you on behalf of both of us. As I think most of you will know, but it bears repeating, because some of you may, may be new to this room, uh, this is a, an, uh, an opportunity for senior women leaders across the organization, academic leaders and administrative leaders, to come together for networking, for professional development, and just for an opportunity to build relationships across the university. And uh, I think the, the quality of conversation and uh, the amount that people enjoy getting together is a really good sign for this network. Uh, we will continue to bring you uh, hopefully interesting sessions and are always open to your suggestions, so keep letting us know uh, what you're interested in hearing about. We know that uh, you're all very busy. Uh, we work very hard to try to find a time that works for you, and this seems to be a time that is very popular, but we do appreciate that you make the time to be here. Um, I'll just mention for myself, and I always laugh when I do this at this event, and it's not the first time, I actually have to leave early because I have a child who needs me to take her to the doctor. So I'll be um, leaving early, and uh, Denise has uh, gracefully uh, accepted the onerous responsibility of thanking our panel at the end. So thank you, Denise, for doing that. Um, I would also say that uh, you know, for those of you who have colleagues who should be at this group, I'd really encourage you to encourage them to come. Let us know if there's anyone we seem to be missing in our invite list. Uh, we have created this as an opportunity for senior women across the university to come together. And if we're missing anybody, that's something we need to know so we can bring the right people together. I want to thank Ryerson Food Services. Josh Namaharaj is here today, our executive chef. I want to thank them for the delicious food and the wonderful service, so maybe you can thank them with me. I want to thank Mary Anthony and Kate Wambi uh, for all the uh, impeccable organization that makes this come off uh, so well. So thank you very much, Kate and Mary. And finally, I'd like to introduce to you our panel who are going to be joining us. And maybe you can come up as I am introducing you. Um, we have an interesting panel today composed of Marie Boutriani, Carla Cassidy, Imogen Co., and Liz Evans, some of Ryerson's senior academic leaders who are here to talk about their experiences. And Denise O'Neill Green will be moderating the panel. I'm not going to do more introduction. The bios are on the table for you to learn more about them. And thank you very much again for coming, and enjoy our panel. So are these mics on? I guess not. Oh, yes, they are. So I think one of the general rules as an administrator at Ryerson is you have to learn how to navigate these high, high chairs here. <laughs> Hopefully, I'll pass the test. So it's wonderful to be with all of you here today. And I'm very honored to moderate our panel discussion. And so uh, given that Julia has already introduced everyone, why don't we just jump right into the conversation? And Imogen is signaling to me, let's just move this back a little bit. OK. Now I can see you. Yes. Excellent. So um, let's start out with uh, you, Imogen, and, and Carla as well. So the both of you have taken what could be considered a traditional career path, 
uh, becoming a senior leader in academia. Could you just share with us some of the challenges that you've encountered along the way? Maybe a few specific examples for us? <laughs> okay, um, I should say that uh, administration is not a normal trajectory for academics. Um, that when we go into academia, we are going in to become tenured faculty and hopefully full professors. That's the normal trajectory. So it's a bit unusual in other organizations, people aspire to be managers and directors and move their way up. And so I think what I found uh, is that you really need to cajole and sometimes coerce people into taking on administrative roles, particularly at the chair level, which is where people normally start. So I was coerced into becoming a chair. I never thought I'd be an administrator. Um, and uh, <clears throat> I was asked to take it on. I refused the first time, and five years later, I felt that it was my duty to take it on. And I think that's a part of collegial governance, is that we take our turns in leadership. And um, I was not surprised by the challenges. I knew they were there, a deeply divided department. Um, only two women in the department, me and Gerda Keggy, who, was, who had to retire the next year. Uh, it was daunting, um, a department that had had about six or seven hires since the time I was hired and had not hired another woman since. So uh, <laughs> it was um, daunting. I think the thing, the most important thing I learned was um, that a sense of humor goes a long way. It doesn't mean you have to be like Joan Rivers, uh, a comedian. <laughs> but you need to have a sense of humor in that you don't take anything too seriously. Uh, I mean, I shouldn't say, <laughs> I mean that you don't take yourself too seriously. And um, I, I find that a sense of humor can diffuse anger. I had, you know, when people would be like this far from my face screaming at me that I was the most vindictive person <laughs> they had ever met. I sort of went, oh, really? No one's ever said that to me before. Um, not that that diffused the anger, but they went away anyway. Um, but I find, I find that in, uh, in the tense meetings that we had when I first became chair, that um, a sense of humor, of being able to say you're sorry, um, goes a long way. Um, so I'll leave it at that. Yeah, so I would echo much of that, um, definitely a sense of humor. Um, I, I fell into administration because I was cajoled and coerced in, into it. Um, I, think the, I think I was also aware of the challenges. Um, I think I didn't realize um, how wearing it would be as I went through the process I was in um, to not see myself reflected. So being a woman in science, technology, and engineering, math, woman in STEM, um, as you move through academic leadership, there are fewer and fewer, and just to, con to repeatedly be in settings where you're the only woman in the room, um, because the dean is a, a man and both the associate deans and all the other chairs are all male. Year after year after year, I found that to be quite wearing. I didn't realize that, so that was a bit of a challenge for me, and then I had to sort of go out and seek my tribe and, and hang out with them and um, sort of get re-energized. So that was a bit of a challenge, but I knew that was gonna be there. Um, I think I learned uh, that the challenge was to, um, one of the challenges was also to really uh, learn about myself and really be able to distinguish the, the me and my self-worth from the work I was doing. And so using humor to do that, one of the best pieces of advice people, somebody once gave me was, uh, you know what this is? You know, and I, I still do this to people. You know what this is? Thick skin, thick skin. <laughs> And, uh, you know, don't take it personally, especially when it's personal. And um, you can do a really good job um, uh, even with all of that stuff. And so I, I, the challenge was to really sort of embrace that self-awareness as it came along. And that was a bonus to me in terms of my um, development as an academic leader. I didn't realize how much richer of a person it would actually make me. You know, Imogen, uh, when you mentioned about the setting and it being weary and being one of a few women uh, or the only one, uh, it makes me reflect on my own experience in undergrad and also in my master's program. 
I never saw one African-American professor, let alone an African-American female professor. So the idea of that type of role being possible for me hadn't even entered my mind until many, many years later. So I, I think there are multiple uh, challenges that all of us face from our various positionality, whether it be class, whether it be from a pr particular geographical region, um, being from the US, they pride themselves on certain values, citizenship, and so forth. But when you really look at the academy, um, for me, the, the values of equity, diversity, and inclusion are talked about, but not necessarily put into practice nearly as much as it's talked about. And if the status of women, given that we're at least 50%, if not more, within the academy, you would expect us to be represented across the board. Marie and Liz, for you, in thinking about the challenges we've just shared, anything similar to that or differences, given that your career path hasn't necessarily been quite the same as the traditional? Well, I started in academia in 1985. I was a professor at Wolfrid Laurier. And um, I lived here, we lived here, and I commuted. And then uh, about 28 years ago, I got pregnant with our first child. And the commute got really rough. And then I thought, then I made a conscious decision to leave full-time academia. So that wasn't an external force so much as, an in, as a personal decision, because I thought, OK, never mind the commuting. I could probably do that. Uh, but uh, I don't want to spend weekends um, doing publications. I'd rather spend weekends and evenings with a baby. So that, I think that's still a challenge in any profession for professional women, is balancing that. So that, that um, and academia is no exception. Um, so I made a conscious decision, and I, 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 went into, I went into applied psychology and then was the chief psychologist for the Hamilton Board for a good decade. So I've been in administration in one way or another since 1989, and there are similarities wherever, wherever you work in administration. It's really leadership and management. I agree uh, with Carla. Uh, if you don't have a sense of humor in politics, you shouldn't go into politics. <laughs> if you don't have a thick skin, or you don't have the capability of developing a thick skin, you shouldn't go into politics. Uh, then I went into fundraising. I was president of the ROM. It's the same thing. It's like being a real estate agent. You're rejected nine out of 10 times. You go, you ask for a million dollars, and when you're a newbie, the way I was a newbie in 2007 at the ROM, I was shocked that I just wouldn't get the million dollars. I mean, why, why would you give me a million dollars? I'm so nice. Um, the ROM is so great, uh, but you get rejected a lot. So again, if you don't have a sense of humor, if you don't have thick skin, and by thick skin, it's not necessarily being uh, uh, insensitive. It's more like having confidence in yourself. That's really important. Any time I've gone against my instinct and made a decision that was against what I thought I should do, it's blown up in my face for all involved, as opposed to making a tough decision that your instinct says, this has to change. It's blown up in my face if I haven't followed my instincts. So if I have one piece of advice besides all the, the pieces that have all, you've already heard is fo um, have confidence and follow your instinct. And it'll lead you. I've changed jobs so many times, and uh, some people say I can't keep a job. But uh, you have to have confidence to do that. Because there's always the fear like you'll never get another job. Uh, but if you have confidence, uh, I think that's the biggest uh, thing. And know yourself. I would say that my trajectory has probably been quite different. And I actually came into the academic world because of my administrative experience, because I came straight into an administrative position. Um, so, you know, I think you face when you go to a new environment, new organization. And I have been out of the academic world for many years um, since I was an MBA student. But you, you know, you go into a new organization and you have to do the typical things. You have to figure out what the uh, formal and informal structures are uh, within an organization, and, and that pretty much applies whether it's academia or, or elsewhere. Um, but I think the thing for me that maybe was challenging, um, but that I focused on was, 
You have to figure, because I didn't come with a credential either. I've, I've done my PhD since I got here, so, so I didn't have the academic um, chops per, sh per se. So you have to figure out how, what you can contribute and how you earn a certain level of respect um, when it's not an automatic given that you're going to have respect within the academic environment. And I think that was probably one of the biggest, um, biggest learnings, but biggest issues for me was just you know finding, finding where I could settle in. Um, and of course, a sense of humor was absolutely um, a given that you had to have. Probably my biggest um, challenge was coming to terms with the fact that unlike a corporate environment where you can walk down the hall and people are in their offices and you can talk to them, um, in the academic environment, that's not necessarily the case. And so, um, so that was a big revel you know, revelation for me in terms of, of uh, starting to understand how you communicate with people as well and, and you know, having to make some, some changes in terms of uh, your, you know, your working style with people too. Carla, let's pick up on that uh, theme of respect. So, so tell us a little bit more as to what you did because you didn't have what is considered the traditional credential. How did you go about gaining that respect? respect. Um, well, I think um, it, it's already been mentioned and I would just reinforce it. I think you really have to know yourself uh, and know, you know what your strengths are and what you have uh, to contribute. And so in my case, um, you know, I knew that the administrative side of things were not easy, but relatively straightforward for me. And so bringing that skill set um, and, and sharing that skill set, and in fact, um, for a period of time when uh, Wendy Souquier was the associate dean within the, uh, the business faculty, she and I sort of had a bit of a reverse mentoring relationship with one another, and she would talk about this. I think she talked about it at the first uh, meeting of this group, and you know, I had to go to her um, to get academic mentorship because I needed to understand how the academic community worked and, and to navigate through it. Um, but she would come to me sometimes for administrative mentorship, so you know, we would balance uh, some of that with one another. But I think the respect comes out of um, first of all, understanding that you don't have the academic credentials, so you know there's no point in kidding yourself that um, you're going to be seen as uh, as a true academic, and then figuring out what your role is and how you contribute um, within your own uh, within your own skills and within your, in your own expert experience that you can bring to it. And did I call you, Carla? You did. But Liz. I answered anyway. Liz. See, see, yeah. that's right. <laughs> I didn't hear that question. That's right. That's okay. Question. I'll answer to it. <laughs> no, no, not at all. That's Forgive okay. me for that. Not at all. So, Liz, thank you for sharing that. Now, jumping back to Carla, when you mentioned about being uh, coerced, uh, recruited, or maybe voluntold, can can you tell us a little bit more about that experience and and what convinced you just to move forward and take the plunge? I, I did it out of a sense of uh, a duty. I mean, I have to say that once I did it, I loved it. I love administration and um, continued on after that. Um, but, um, and, and I, I think that's true of a lot of people at the chair's level that you take it on as a sense of obligation. Um, I was very fortunate. I had uh, tremendous support from a certain number of people in the department, and it was just when the internet was being developed. <laughs> so because our meetings were so um, um, mean and nasty, of people yelling at each other and pounding the table, and, and um, that I said that what we would do is uh, we would um, not meet physically, but we would meet by the internet. Um, email was just starting. Uh, I said, and that way you can think about what you say. We don't have all of this physical overlay and uh, emotion. Uh, we have a record of what you said, because of course that's always very contentious. And you really can take a bit of time to think it through. And um, we did that for a year. We just did not meet physically. <laughs> and did the departmental business via email. So uh, that was, I'm, um, uh, that was a, a lucky, lucky break for me. Excellent, excellent. So given um, it's, there's a report 
by the Council of Canadian Academies on Strengthening Canada's Research Capacity, the gender dimension. And from some of the findings, uh, it was revealed that women outnumber men as undergraduate and master's students and represent nearly half of PhD students. This has been the trend for the last 20 years. Yet we have not seen it reflected among the ranks of the professorate, uh, specifically the full professor level or the senior administration. So in, in considering that and thinking about the status of women in that way, each of you, uh, excuse me, each of you, could you just share why you think that disparity exists? And what do you think could be done to address it? Oh, she's looking at you. <laughs> oh, it's a complex. I mean, there's so many, so many elements there, um, and there are disciplinary differences. Um, there are, you know, there there are still myths out there that are about what's required to be successful. There is, um, there is still a, a, a use of language that I think is uh, problematic, um, the, that I think um, there's, a, there's a big debate going on in Britain right now about the use of chairman. Um, should you use the term chairman? And there's all, all sorts of discourse going on on the interwebs about, we seem to have got past that here, but in the UK it's, it's very um, politicized. Um, so that sort of speaks to um, how you might see yourself reflected in a position of that kind. Um, there's, um, there's I, in my field, um, I see a massive drop off in confidence um, amongst young women as they move through, um, through the academic pathway. Um, and uh, we haven't done a very good job about either understanding why that is or how to address it. Um, and it, and it's complex, but I think um, even acknowledging it exists and it's real and it's, it's a cultural, contextual thing, I think. Um, and the fact that it becomes a gender issue, um, it's, it's a women's issue or it's a marginalized population issue, um, allows it to be put on one side and, and it to be um, set as something that is somebody else's problem. So in my discipline, I always try to frame these things as human rights issues. It's a human rights issue, and if you're not taking advantage of 50% of the population mm -hmm. and their brain power and their um, ability and their contributions, then we as, a, as, a, as humanity are losing out. So we should all be concerned about these things, but it becomes a gender issue. So women don't want to go into science or they don't want to do physics or they, you know, just because their brains are wired that way, well actually no, there's all sorts of data out there to suggest that that's not the case. And, you know, for humanity's sake, we'd better start taking that seriously and figuring out how to, to redress some of those things. And there's all sorts of things, you know, that are being done to sort of try and redress some of those things. Well said. Marie? I just think, um, I'm, I mean, I'm, uh, I'm an administrator. I was an academic, and I love teaching. And I taught a lot over the years, but I'm not an academic. I don't publish in journals. I haven't since 1993. So I, you know, I admit that, uh, but I've got a, a great school that I'm running with great people that really contribute to the university. Having said all that, I think part of, I think academia is changing too. And I think with the social media, with the economy being as it is, uh, people are, young people are questioning an academic career. And um, we have 800 part-time instructors at the Chang School, many of which have PhDs, who, teach a little here, teach a little there, teach a little there. And I, I, just from my experiences in politics, women in politics, again, I know I'm generalizing, and forgive me, but my, mine and others' observations is we're pretty practical. So if we see a lot of uh, negativity or if we see uh, a, a career path that isn't what we were told it would be, we look for other solutions. We look for solutions. So it could be some of that is happening as well, which is unfortunate because uh, uh, academia is, is, is important and in all points of view should be represented. But I actually have heard that from a lot of young people in general, women and men, 
what's the point of doing a PhD if I'm going to just be teaching sessional for 10 years? I'd rather do something else. It's a kind of a different generation. Whereas for me, it was, well, of course, you do a master's, you do a PhD, and, and, and magically, you'll, you'll be fine. Uh, it's a very practical uh, young group of people right now, w women and men. So I think there's a little bit of that. The other is, for publications, for example, what does it all mean now with all the information out there, publishing something? I mean, my husband's an academic, and I respect the fact that he's a great academic, and he publishes his resumes this thick, and he talks about citations. That's what matters, citations. And, and, and I, I respect that. But what does, put that in the context of today, where you can find almost any piece of information you want on the internet, and what does it all mean? And I think you have to put that in the mix as well. Uh, and I'm not sure if it's a female male thing, but it's definitely a young people thing right now. Carla or Liz? Um, <clears throat> well, I, I, um, I think that human beings have a natural desire to replicate themselves, and so I think that one of the fundamental problems in uh, through the hiring process that we do in universities is that the hiring committee wants to replicate itself. And so if the hiring committee is virtually or almost all male, of course, that they are going to identify with male candidates. So in, in the politics department where Gerd and I, as the only two women in the department, had sat through eight hires in which very qualified women somehow just weren't quite up to the mark, um, we just hired men, um, and uh, so when I became a chair, this is a real priority, and um, I think what you need to do is prime the pump, and um, it's not something you do all the time, but you prime the pump, and we, um, we set up the hiring committee according to the collective agreement. Uh, in the past, the whole department participated in hires, including probationary faculty, with all the problems uh, entailed in that. So we set up a hiring committee in which the chair had three votes and the, and the elected members had two. Do you know what I mean? So I had a sort of um, more majority. And, uh, and it changed. We started hiring excellent candidates, men and women. And today, the politics department, I think, exceeds the national average in terms of PhDs graduating in politics. Um, because it just isn't an issue anymore. In the last hire, there were the top three candidates were all women. It's not an issue because the, we primed the pump, the, the, the demographics in the department were different, and it's just not an issue. When I was dean, um, actually, Errol Aspovic, the provost and the uh, VPFA, uh, Michael Dusen, uh, had this very interesting idea, which really worked well. Because, politic, uh, because uh, the Faculty of Arts was growing so much and we had a lot of hires, um, what would happen is I would give the department, I would say, you have a hire. I would meet all the shortlisted candidates. If I felt that there were people of any of the designated groups there that seemed to be viable candidates, I would say to the chair when they came to me and said, we want to hire candidate A who was a white male, let's say, and I would say, oh, okay, and tell me a bit about the process and tell me about the other candidates. Well, the second candidate, who maybe was a, a woman or a, a visible minority person or something, would say, they were good, they were so close, it was a really hard decision, but candidate A really had it. So then <laughs> I would say, well, um, how would you like two hires? And I'm telling you, that worked. Like, it changed the, because they go, oh, because, I mean, in a sense, they had said it was a really excellent candidate. And, uh, you know, the difference between candidate A and candidate B, man, if you've ever been in a hiring, like, these things are not the gospel truth. This person is definitively better. It's so complex. And so we did a number of hires that way, brought in fabulous people, and the face of the faculty changed. And once the face of the faculty change, you've primed the pump, and it isn't the big issue that it used to be. So, and the incentive was that uh, what Errol and Michael Dusen said is that they would bridge that position. So I had given a position a year ahead of when I had it, and that they would finance that position for that year. After a while, of course, the chairs were on to me, and so. <laughs> But, but, but it did, I mean, we did a tremendous amount of hiring um, and, and, it, and the, the face of the faculty changed dramatically. There are some departments, as Imogen said, that you cannot, I, I, economics, 
hiring a PhD, a woman in economics, like good luck. And we would be in bidding wars with other universities. They could write their own ticket. And I remember once um, I had to say to the chair of the economics department, I'm really sorry, but this candidate, a newly minted PhD, I am offering her a salary higher than yours. Seriously. And he just turned to me and said, you know what, I'm an economist, I understand supply and demand. <laughs> Um, I would, you know, certainly I, I would reiterate that it is a complex issue. I, and whether this is done for positive or negative reasons, I actually think women um, have a, a more practical approach sometimes to what they think their career trajectory should be or they want it to be. Mm -hmm. And, you know, whereas I think um, maybe on the male side, there's more of a drive to believe you have to get to the top to be successful. I actually think that women have become better at, at gauging along the way where their position and where their success and what fulfills them comes from. So I think, and some of that may come out of a very negative space because of expectations, but I think there is a certain um, you know, female uh, capacity or capability to look at that and understand that within themselves and approach that thought process about careers a little differently than, than what men uh, would typically do. So that would be my only thought to add. I remember in graduate school that some of my classmates would just lay out their five-year career plan. I'm going to graduate this year. I'm going to be a senior administrator this year. I'm going to become president this year. They had it all laid out. Whereas I'm just trying to get from one class to the next, take care of my kids, uh, take care of my family, and be able to sustain myself in, in a doctoral program. But they were already thinking ahead in that way. And I'm wondering, where does that come from? What kind of socialization do they get that they feel so privileged to set the trajectory for themselves in that way? And we not necessarily uh, don't do the same thing because of so many competing interests and other obligations that we have. Marie? I was just going to say, in another area, in the corporate board area, um, <clears throat> only 12% of members on corporate boards are women. And so just now, the Ontario Securities Commission has a program to try and enhance that and have more. So I've sat on a, on a board for years now, and for years I was the only woman. It was an engineering company. That was a lot of fun. Okay. Uh, and I mean, it was classic. It was, it was, you could do a sitcom over how they, they spoke. One other woman, just one other woman, made the huge difference. You first brought camaraderie. Uh, you started getting a little critical mass. Uh, they had to look at both of us, or at least one of us. I actually had the chair, who was a very wonderful man, say, uh, well, you know, when the executives talk, they look at the, the male uh, board members, not at the female board members. I can't ignore that, you know. Not that, well, if you have more of us, they can't ignore us. You know? So why am I bringing this up? When one area improves in this issue, it generalizes to another area. More female doctors, more female academics, more female board members, more female politicians. Sorry, the end of a cold. Um, it all generalizes. So, and the more we do that, the more we encourage young women uh, to, go, to, to you know, go beyond their comfort zone and, right, and try things that uh, uh, are challenging, uh, it, it opens paths for other young women. I was saying at the table, when I first ran 20 years ago, I was canvassing with my husband and uh, one guy at the door said, why, why isn't he running? Why are you running? Well, I didn't hear that in subsequent elections. Uh, another one said, uh, we only vote for Anglo-Saxons up here. That was my first election. Didn't hear that in subsequent elections. So in other words, you have to hear it, you have to uh, blaze the path for yourself and others, and then that generalizes to people being desensitized to, being, to having women in a lot of areas, not just in the area that you're trailing, you're blazing the trail. Okay, that's just... So oftentimes, and, and some of you have alluded to this, uh, oftentimes it's quoted as an excuse of not seeing more women in leadership because we don't put ourselves forward, or maybe I should say we don't quite lean in, uh, depending on how you see that. Um, 
How has that experience been for you, and what can institutions do to encourage more women to engage? <laughs> I've actually never had an issue. I've leaned in. Maybe it's because I grew up in a traditional Greek family where if I didn't lean in, I wouldn't get what I wanted. I wouldn't have had a post-secondary education. I wouldn't have, uh, you know, dated at the age of 99. Like, I wasn't allowed to do anything. <laughs> so um, I think I had to lean in. And so I've never had a problem. And I, maybe I've been lucky. But every time I've gone for a leadership position, it's never really, to my knowledge, been an issue. Mm -hmm. Now, what's, what is said behind closed doors, I don't, have a, I don't have control over. And I certainly have not succeeded at everything I've tried out for. So there may have been some hidden factors that I don't know about. But uh, I, uh, especially here at Ryerson, I'm pretty, I think it's, it's, it's pretty cool here at Ryerson. Yeah, I would have to say that I, which is a good point, having arrived here, I would say actually it's a, it's a very supportive environment. Um, and a more equitable environment than other places. I, I think um, building structures and putting mechanisms in place to actually support women um, who are interested in building careers, empowering women to build careers um, in areas that they're passionate about is something that, um, I mean, this kind of thing, doing this at different levels, doing this at the graduate level, doing this amongst student leaders, um, and it doesn't, ex and not to the exclusion of our male students, because I don't think you can exclude them. You have to empower, you have to educate them to understand that there's nothing threatening or, or problematic about women being in charge or being, you know, or leading. Um, I've been called bossy, I've been called abrasive, I've been called a bitch. Um, I embrace all of those things. I bring it on, I welcome <laughs> it. Um, you know, I, I think it's okay in saying it's okay, um, that, that those words are okay with me. I, I'm very weary of being described as female dean of science or female scientist because um, that means that we haven't progressed. So calling people out on those kinds of things, I'm a dean, I'm a scientist, I'm a leader, I'm not a gender version of that. Um, I've started calling out um, panels. I've started calling out, um, I, there's two panels recently, both of which were about innovation and barriers to innovation. Both of them in two different locations in downtown Toronto were exclusively male. And if there's a barrier to innovation, I would say it's not embracing 50% of your population. Actually, they were, they were exclusively white male as well, so it's even, you know. Um, but I think the irony of both of those different panels of pretty high profile places was, was completely lost on those people that put them together. And they didn't, it wasn't malicious, it wasn't exclusive, it was just clueless, you know, they just don't see it. And so actually to start calling people out and just holding, holding people and organizations and boards accountable and doing it in a very measured and a very um, transparent way and doing it in a way that has is authentic and has integrity and is not, you know, highly charged and highly emotional. I think, um, hopefully, I mean, our role as academic leaders is to, to push those things out of the way, hopefully to leave a little bit of a clearer path for those people that are coming along behind. And then to go back to those uh, young women and actually um, give them the strategies um, to present, to build confidence, to um, not doubt themselves, to show in all of the glory and the, you know, the, the, all of the gory detail how, yes, you can have a family and a career. You need a supportive network. It could be your parents. It could be your partner. It could be your community. Um, but all of those things are possible. Everybody comes in all sorts of shapes and sizes and colors and differences. It's not just women, it's humanity, and we're all part of humanity, and so are you, and so we need to make sure that everybody's represented and just keep getting that message out. And I'm hearing from what you've said that intentionality is very important. You can't just assume that it will happen automatically, for example, with the panel, with the planning. And maybe I'm a little bit biased here, but I might suspect that the planners might have been women. 
Some of them, sure. Yeah, and I'm actually, you know, part of my journey has become, uh, has been my own awareness of the intentionality. So I would sometimes have a very defense, a very sort of aggressive defensive response about being angry about something, and then I'd have to sort of deconstruct that. Why am I really angry? And, and it's because I'm not reflected. Um, you know, we weren't um, uh, consulted, or, you know, it could have been all of those things. Right. And then, figure that out and then say, okay, so in order to fix that, here are the things I have to do. So, um, so learning to be conscious myself, learning to, 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 to be very aware um, and to build strategies around how to be intentional about doing some of those things. Um, it's great um, education, it's a great education for dealing with toddlers and teenagers as well. So, you know, to really be intentional and say, you know. Um, so, yeah, I think, I think it's having that level of awareness um, and, and trying harder. It's not good enough. We all need to try harder. Well, we asked 100 women to serve on the panel, and we couldn't find anyone. They all turned us down. Okay, so go out and ask another 100 and another 100, you know, because there are all sorts of great women out there, all of whom have opinions. Right, right. I think part of uh, your question was what institutions might do um, in this regard as well. And to some extent, intentionality. I think succession planning can play a really big role in helping to move um, this intentionality or thought process forward. Um, you know, I, uh, while search committees have a certain value to them, I think that they can be fraught with certain um, challenges. And I think we don't look at the importance of succession. Uh, in terms of helping to build academic leadership and, ha and creating an environment where people don't feel like they have to be coerced or jump off the deep end to get into academic leadership, but rather feel that they're being nurtured and developed along to actually then step into roles. And so if I was to look at something that an institution, any institution could do, and I'd say whether it's you know, a university or whether it's corporate, that more effort and more time should be put into something like a succession plan. And that obviously means that you, know, you have to have certain capability and capacity in hiring, et cetera. But, but I think that that would be a big step forward for uh, most right. institutions. Right. Carla, did you want to add? Um, I've had great mentors in my day, uh, men and women. And what a mentor does is sees in you more than you see in yourself. And um, I, I think that's what we can do for people as leaders. Um, they're looking around the room. I see people who I think I have mentored in saying, I really think you can do this, or we really need, um, <clears throat> you can, you know, here's a position I think you would be great at. I, I think that's what people really need. And um, I think it's really looking at people and, and seeing what their strengths are and then encouraging them to go beyond what they see themselves. Is that for us? No. Okay. <laughs> Hello? It's not for me. Finding the talent within different individuals, succession planning, and with succession planning, trying to look at the entire organization and see who's at the table, who's at the top, <coughs> who's missing, who's a part of it, who's not. When I arrived here, I have to confess, one of the first questions that came to my mind was, where are the black women leaders in higher education? Because I'm coming here trying to figure out where is my niche? Who can I connect with? And I've learned along the way that other women of various backgrounds, but specifically racialized women and women of color, have reached out to me in a multiplicity of ways because they haven't seen those role models out there. And I think in part of what an institution can do is have this idea of looking at who's in the pipeline, who do we need to bring to the table, whose voices are missing, and not just assume, again, going back to the theme of intentionality, not just assume people are just going to move up because of their talent or simply because of merit or that it will happen automatically. Because mentoring and coaching 
helps to draw that out of individuals and helps them to see that there is a career path. I had no idea there was really a career path in academia. I just wanted to get a PhD because I wanted people to listen to me. So here I am, <laughs> you know? I wanted to have something to say and I knew, uh, I had something to say and I knew that in academia, people usually don't listen to you unless you have those three letters behind, behind your name. But although that really shouldn't be, that was what I picked up from the culture in order to advance and move forward. So in, in reflecting on some of this, we, we've talked about some of the challenges. What have been some of the aspects of your career that has really motivated you and, and uh, fueled your passion for what you do? In a what? Fueled your passion. Yes. It's always been personal for me. So I went into psychology because as an immigrant's child, uh, I had discrimination, put in a slow learner's class, et cetera. So I'm sure subconsciously that's why I went into psychology. I went into politics because I thought the government of the day was uh, abrasive and insensitive to educators, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, I left politics because one of my children needed me, uh, older children. They, they never stopped needing it, right? Uh, uh, and so that was personal. Um, so for me, it's always been personal. That's what, what fuels me. Um, not to get elected for, I mean, Ontario politicians don't even have a pension, so it's not the money. It's to actually uh, address something that's affected me personally and therefore others. That's, that's what fuels me. So when I, and I get students coming all the time that I know we could be serving better, and we do after, I mean, got a great team, but th that, that, that there's a little bit of, of me in there saying, okay, someone, if it wasn't for that grade one teacher who said, you don't belong in a slow learner's class, I don't know if I'd be here, right? Uh, so, and, and various mentors along the way. So, um, and I, th I don't think we have, we should never underestimate our effect, especially on young people, like on mentoring. I'm, I'm shocked decades later when I get emails from, former students, right, saying this really made a big difference in my life. That one sentence you said to me when I was in high school and ready to quit, uh, and, and I'm a social worker or a psychologist or an engineer. So um, for me, it's always been personal, rather than, um, I, I wasn't recruited to go into politics. I looked in the yellow pages to find the Ontario Liberal Party. I mean, I, I wasn't a card carrying anything. Uh, so, but it was, I didn't like what was going on. And that, that's powerful motivation, I think. Yeah, I think I, the, so I didn't, you know, I fell into academic leadership. It's not, I didn't, I always wanted just to figure out how cells work. I like cells, you know, I want to know how they work, but, and over here I'm doing this other stuff. Um, but I do find it enormously satisfying to um, uh, make things right. Um, for people who feel like they don't have a voice. That's how I ended up being coerced and cajol cajoled into being a chair in the first place, is because a lot of people would uh, complain about things and, and feel like they weren't being listened. And I was the only person there at the time who was willing to actually stand up in front of other people and say, this isn't right, this needs to be fixed, this needs to be changed. I actually went back even further than that as a graduate student. Um, maybe even further. Maybe I was just obnoxious as a child. I don't know. Um, so to give people who don't have a voice a voice um, and to uh, make things right that aren't fair. And I think um, that comes from a very, very uh, deeply entrenched sense of values that my parents um, raised us with, which I think is um, fairness um, is, is really important and authenticity and you know, even if you don't have very much, you're fair and you share it in a fair way, um, which in a university system can be really challenging. Um, uh, so it's, it's, it's the um, being a voice for people, um, making things right and trying to, trying to make things fair. Um, and I get enormous satisfaction about, out of seeing other people succeed. And I think some, sometimes that's a little bit of a pathology I have because it, if other people succeed at my expense, I'm okay with that. Mm -hmm. So, um, 
to see young people succeed in getting their first grant or getting their first paper or come, being successful in teaching a course or passing a course or um, uh, getting a good grade or whatever it is. I, I find that enormously satisfying and I enjoy that and it gives me a lot of pleasure and that's, that's why I do it because, you know, like I said, it's not money or glory, so. Yeah. I, I think um, I was motivated uh, for two reasons. One is um, I loved university. I hated high school. I was one of these kids that just despised high school. I went to university and I just loved it. And part of what I really tried to do during my years of administration was to try to engage as many, to make it possible for as many students as possible to have the kind of experience that I had. Um, the other thing I think that, um, I don't know, sort of gets me going is that there are people that think that uh, administration is like figure skating, uh, you know, and I don't mean pairs or doubles, I mean solos, triple lots, center ice. Um, but really administration is um, about hockey and it's about being the coach behind the bench and just inspiring, cajoling, uh, we keep using that word, um, just making every uh, player do the very best they can and collectively something miraculous happens, you have a team effort. And um, I, I think that's what I grew to love about administration was building teams. I had fantastic teams of people you know, in my administrative staff uh, in terms of the chairs and right down to faculty members. The other image that I use is that good administration is like motor oil. You know, it makes every part of the machine work better. You know, and and it, it's that, um, I, the, I love doing that. I mean, I, I think building teams, making every, the, ex, the university experience, both for faculty, staff, and for students, as good as we could possibly make it, given all the constraints we're under financially, et cetera. Uh, certainly from, for me, um, leadership and my career development has been really about either seeing problems or opportunities and, and having this um, tremendous need to try and either fix things or um, seize opportunities and make things happen. So, and, uh, and I probably didn't come to understand that about myself until I was well into my career and I was reflecting back because I moved around um, to various um, places, common thread, but moved around and I started to see a pattern because I typically would find myself ending up in some place that needed, um, needed things done, right? It wasn't just a, a, an operation uh, status quo. And so I, I think the things that really motivate me are where those opportunities exist and where you can bring people in and, um, and really engage uh, and, and make things happen. And, and one of the big things for me coming to the academic world at the uh, point where I did was really the opportunity to work with um, students and with young people. I mean, I think that um, um, and that probably is one of the most exciting parts of what I get to do, um, is to see what happens with them and to see them grow and develop over the four years or whatever that um, we get to engage with them and, and then feel really positive about, you know, hopefully what's going to happen when they go out. So that's huge for me. That's excellent. Um, I, I see some people nodding off. Should we um, um, open it up to questions or something? Is that, is that part of this? Yes. Oh, yes, okay. it is. Sorry. <laughs> You're taking a leadership role. I'm sorry. Right? <laughs> <laughs> the room is a little warm, isn't it? It is, yeah. Yes, it, it, it is. A little interaction might, might, might be good. Okay, good suggestion. So we can open it up for questions. Are there questions that anyone have for our panelists? Thank, thank you, Marie. Thank you for not <laughs> kicking me off the panel. <laughs> no, never, never, never. Any qu Oh, yes. Um, so I have a question, sorry, thank you, that maybe touches back on what um, a few of you were talking about with respect to confidence and having confidence in your decision making and having an awareness. Um, and I, I do personally think that that is a gender issue. I'm looking around, I've been doing this uh, a few times throughout this panel, and the women who are represented here, I'm going to assume um, 
have been in their, their career for quite some time. So when we're looking at younger women who are entering um, their professional careers and looking at career trajectory, one, I'm just wondering, um, or I think there'd be a really great opportunity to develop some type of formalized mentorship program for women um, and looking at the relationship between uh, accomplished women and, and the career trajectory vision. And I'm wondering from your experience, when you're talking about mentorship, what did that intersection look like for you when you did have children? Um, because when we're talking about confidence and wanting to go out there and do all of these things, it's very hard, I think, when you're trying to juggle a professional career, you're trying to be a fantastic parent um, and perhaps doing education on the side, um, how can the women here at Ryerson better support those women who are wanting to move up the ranks? Well, at our table, that's a great question. At our table, we were talking about groups like Women of Influence. So I got two mentees on that, for example. Um, mentoring, actually, it doesn't even have to be formal. Mentoring your neighbor's daughter. I'm trying to mentor my own 23, 24 year old, almost 24 year old daughter. She's just terrified of her future. And I said, don't worry. If there's one regret I have in life, is I worry too much. You know, things are going to happen. Just keep at it, be the best you can be. Um, we are looking at, for, at the Chang School of having a mentorship program with our alumni, not necessarily women only. Um, basically, our, our Chang School students with alumni that have been successful uh, because they've made the jump to go back to work while raising a family, while working full time. And boy, if anyone needs you know, reinforcement that, uh, you know, carry on and this will all be worth it, it's, it's people that are doing that. Um, so um, I'm all for the formal mechanisms, but I would also encourage you informally to do it. Because a lot of my most successful mentors have been informal. In fact, I can't think of any formal mentor I've had. It's been someone that I've said, whoa, I want to be like her. And then, you know, uh, ask her some questions. Um, so there's the formal, I agree, we're going to do it at the Chang School overall. But I think just to, to take advantage of, uh, I, th I think I'm blessed, I've had all these opportunities and I feel I owe it to young women and men uh, to, to help if I can. The one message I always give my daughter and all her friends is stop worrying so much. This generation is worried and they have reason to worry. The economy is really bad right now in certain parts of Canada and United States uh, and Europe. <laughs> but uh, it, it, it's a cycle and it will turn around and just continue studying, do the best you can what, at whatever you're doing and you'll be fine. That's the, main, that's the main thing I'm seeing in the young people's anxiety, a lot of anxiety. So I think it's really important to identify what, is, what, the, peop, what the young women being mentored need. What, is, what are the questions that they are lacking uh, confidence in? So um, in my discipline, uh, in the sciences, it's I can't go into academia and have children because the time I have to spend in the lab, at the bench, doing my science excludes everything else. Um, and those two things are mutually exclusive. Well, women have been doing these things for years and years and years, and some of them win Nobel Prizes, and some of them teach, I mean, so it's been going on for hundreds and hundreds, and hundreds of years, but it's been going on for a while. Um, what? deconstruct that question and what is it that you're actually worried about? You're worried about your productivity. You're worried about being able to um, put enough hours into an endeavor. So let's look at, so this is what I tell them and I've given talks on early career and family. I mean, they fly me across the country to give talks in science on this. Um, and, and what are the strategies you can use to make you be able to do what it is you need to do? So things like, um, I used to grade papers at swimming lessons. You can sit in the pool and your three-year-old's doing duck, ducks or turtles or whatever it is, and you can grade papers. You can do that, and that's okay. You're allowed to do that. Buy all white socks. Don't have anything but white, so then when you have to match socks, you don't know, it's like, you know, don't stress, put a priority on what are the things you're important, or what's important to you as a parent? Does it really, you know, home cooked food? We've got Josh and now she should be, like everybody's, um, you know, uh, cook. Um, or is it spending time with your children? I used to bring my kids to the lab and I would actually have, um, 
it, it was an unwritten rule for my graduate students or the people that worked for me that every now and again, you're going to have to babysit. <laughs> Um, I would bring my kids when they were babies into departmental meetings, and I wouldn't ask permission. I would say, this is an important thing that's happening. My kids were really, really easy babies, so I was lucky, but this is a really important decision I want to be part of. I'm bringing my kids. I wouldn't ask. I would say, this is what's happening. And it was scary to do that, but you know, I had a few people around me who um, said, of course you can do that. You know, so I was lucky that way. I had a few people like Jill Wu, for instance, who said, yeah, yeah bring them in. Um, so what are, specifically, what are the things that are w worrying you? And then here are some strategies. Here are some things that you can try that worked for me, or here's some things that I heard of that worked for somebody else. Sometimes it's not children, sometimes it's elderly parent. Um, as chair of a department, I had three fathers go off on leave. I arranged all of their teaching and everything for them. Um, one of them ended up being a single father with three kids, one of whom was a special needs kid. You know, so, oh man, did he have his plate full? And so we worked together to figure out what strategies come in early, then his, you know, then his caregiver quit, and then, okay, so we'll move this stuff around. So, um, so it's, it, it's really identifying what is the thing that's so scary, and then figuring out a strategy to bring it down to, to size. So those things that are like giant monsters and you don't want to look in the closet, you know, you work on them for a while and then the next time you open the closet, you discover they're actually only this big and, and you've, you've sort of uh, managed them. So I try to, to be quite sort of intentional and quite pre prescribed. What is it actually that you're worried about? I won't be good at something. What does that mean? I won't be able to publish my papers or I won't get tenure. Okay, so let's break that down and build a time frame for you and let's build a strategy. Or, you know, my kids won't know me, so you need to find the daycare provider who is like your angel. That those people are, those people saved my life. I was a single parent of, of little kids, suddenly. Um, and I had to be a chair and a, um, a research scientist and a full-time parent and everything else. So, but I had a, a, a network and I had people around me and I had a daycare provider who I would, you know, I would kiss her feet because she was an angel who saved my life. And so you, you have to build those things. But that's not what everybody needs. Other people need other things. So um, I, I'm all for mentoring programs, but I think, we, you know, they need they almost, we need to like have strategies, manuals almost, like <coughs> this is something you can do and this works for some people. You know, don't, I, yeah, I, I could tell you all sorts of stories about things I did that sort of, you know, to, to get grades in on time, I had uh, my laptop propped up on the bed one time, and I was breastfeeding my daughter <laughs> while I was getting grades. Don't recommend that. But, um, you know, you can do it. And I think it's maybe telling the stories helps. Um, and it's not one size fits all. It's all sorts of different ways, which is what men have been doing all along. They've just been figuring it out and assuming that somebody else will pick up those pieces for them. We worry about it, and we internalize it, and we think it's all our problem. Well, it's not. You know, so I'm very, um, like, we fix this. You could do this. We fix this. We'll get it done. We'll figure it out. Don't have all the answers. But, you know, don't let the anxiety kind of paralyze. So. Even anyone else want to respond? Uh, just two things. Uh, I think that um, because I think juggling family responsibilities and your academic career are clearly uh, very difficult to do, uh, one of the things that you can do that as leaders that you can do is to be interested in people's children. <laughs> you know, so when I see people on the elevator, I go, how many kids do you have now? Like two, how's it going? And it's not that you're going to then mentor them there, but you have opened the door <laughs> to saying, you know, your, ch your, your family responsibilities are also part of who you are. And if you feel you'd like to come and talk to me about the problems you're having in ju juggling your, do you know you open the door as this is a legitimate area of discussion so we don't just talk about people's academic career, but we talk to them as people. Um, and the other thing I think we can do as leaders to inspire more people to do is not to complain all the time about how hard our jobs are. <laughs> you know, like, you know, I, I mean, we, when you're, you know, you're always going, oh man, I have so many meetings and I'm working, you know, seven days a week. Well, who wants to be you then, right? So that I, I think we have to, uh, to sort of try and demonstrate that 
there are also really positive things about being in leadership. We tend to, in our society, the more you know, the more busy you are, the more important you are, and so we, we tend to really overstate how incredibly busy we are as administrators, and so why would, you know, why would people want to take that on? So I, I think we have to maybe mirror some, um, that we, there are good things to our jobs. Did you want to add anything, No, I'm, Liz? Uh, no, I think that's covered the, no answer. That's covered, all right. Yeah. So, any other questions? Yes. Hi, I'm Carrie Ann. Um, so thank you for that. And Carla, you, you kind of went into the direction that I was going to ask anyways. Um, is really, I love being a woman in, at Ryerson especially. There are a lot of opportunities here. Um, and I've been lucky and fortunate in having great leaders and, and mentors. So if you, if you, someone, all of you, it doesn't matter, can uh, tell us about where being a female leader was actually an opportunity where, where that was the benefit in the situation. Big female? Well, yeah. Because well, we often hear that it's, it's not an advantage, and so I really want to kind of turn that into the real positives. What are the real positives? Well, I have two young directors who have, uh, they had babies at the same time, and they're really important members of the Chang School Executive. And I think being a female um, leader, I remember those days and how tough it was, and much tougher then. We had four months off, not a year, and, and not as understanding conditions as today. But basically, baby, their babies come first. Their families come first. And mine are, you know, 20s now, but I have an 83-year-old mom. And uh, last Friday morning, I was in Hamilton with a CCAC worker and my mom making arrangements. You know, tens of thousands of emails and phone calls to return, but She's my mom, and I let it be known that that's what I'm doing, so that if somebody has something like that, uh, a situation like that, not to feel guilty, because in North America, we tend to feel guilty when we take time off of work. Not so much at Ryerson. Ryerson, let's face it, it's a pretty cool place. Uh, but even at Ryerson, it's us inside. We feel like, oh, geez, another day off for our family. Well, you know, if we're leaders, and if we're good leaders, we will more than make up that time either on the weekend or at night or in another way. Or even just the appreciation that we have that flexibility will make us more dedicated employees. I've found that in all of my leadership roles. If you, if you give people the time off they need for their families, you, you get back 100% more in dedication and work ethic. Anyone else like to respond? But Carrie, mm -hmm. are you asking uh, how uh, being a woman is an advantage? how you parlay that into advantage. I think that's an incredibly complicated question because the relationship between men and women and working in a male culture, it's so complicated, but I, I think it's a good point. I, I think that there are ways that um, I certainly found that in some ways I was less threatening. Now, on the other hand, there are people that <laughs> called me a bitch and using called a castrating <laughs> bitch. <gasps> Um, but that, do you know that, that as women, I mean, if you bear in mind that you are generally and often seen as somehow less threatening, I think in some ways you can use that in, in really positive ways, but it's a very complicated, I think it's really about the dynamics of uh, working in what is still predominantly male culture. And um, There's a young man director in our executive as well, who has two children, and asked for Wednesdays off. Well, Wednesdays to work at home, sorry, because of a daycare situation. And I said yes. So that, because in the past, when you would do something like that for women, some men would resent it, right? So the opportunity to do it for a male as well balances that and takes away that possibility of, of uh, envy, uh, et cetera. You, you just get those opportunities and you, you know, and I said the same thing to him. I remember those days. So sure, go ahead, as long as, you know, you're accessible. I would also add that because of the lens that you bring due to your experiences, bringing it to the position that you're in, you add that additional level, that additional dimension that cares about issues related to gender. 
And so, as Imogen mentioned earlier, a panel, something very simple, a panel, and it's all men. Well, what happened here? Who will notice that? And in my role in looking at our various policies and practices and so forth, having that gender lens, having that experience to bring to the table, to me, that's a cool thing. Otherwise, what is it that I bring here? Of course, I bring Denise. I bring that I'm from the US. I bring that I talk funny and have all these other kinds of characteristics. But having that lens and being able to use your voice in that way, as these women have shared earlier, to me, that's very cool. And that's really about change, whether it's at Ryerson or anywhere else, to make it seem to make the environment inclusive, not only for women, but for men, for young people, so that later on in the future, it won't be in the disparity that we just shared earlier. It will be more balanced, because we're bringing that to the table and voicing it. We have time for one more question? Yes. Sorry, can you Could you repeat that, again? that, please? Can you? Yeah. Yes. Yeah, OK. Is this better? Yes. Um, so what I'm curious about is, as you became leaders on your path as becoming a leader, have you ever looked back and thought, oh, I really wish that I had known that? And are you now, or you've learned that, and now you're giving it to new leaders? So I guess what I'm looking at is, what were you missing? And now, are you giving what you were missing to leaders who are emerging now? I, we, 28, 29 years ago, we, it was not the same uh, as it is today. So, well, you know, you, you've got kids. Um, and taking a day off to take your child to the doctor, even that was a stressful question to ask your boss. So I think what I've learned from that is, and, and, you know, and then you resent it as a, an employee. I think what I learned from that is always be cognizant that uh, family situations trump everything, should trump everything, and there's something wrong with our society if it doesn't trump everything. So um, that's what I try very hard. Now, sometimes I fail. Like it's a stressful situation at work, and oh my God, she's away again? You know, I mean, I'm, I'm human, but I try very hard to learn from the fact that I didn't have that and how stressful that was for me. And probably made me not as good an employee as the, the people that my team today, because they have that respect. So there were a few incidents that I uh, experienced as a child growing up or as a young woman or whatever where I was told I couldn't do something. Um, I wanted to be an explorer at one point, a polar explorer. I wanted to go, I wanted to go re, I don't know why, but retrace the steps of Scott of the Antarctic or something like that. I grew up outside of Cambridge. And they had an open house at the British Antarctic Survey, and I went there um, with my father, who was very supportive of us all, um, young women in science, um, and said, I, you know, and I must have been about 10, maybe, and I said, I want to go do this. Um, and they said, no, we only have all male teams go down because of the stress of maybe having mixed gen. This was, so this would have been the 1970s. And I remember that very, very clearly um, as being grossly unfair and thinking, well, I've got to change that. So. Um, and then there were things like girls not playing soccer in England. Um, I'm sure in the 70s, very few girls played hockey and those kinds of things. So the sense of, because you're a girl, you can't do something. Um, so I want to change that. I don't want a girl ever to experience the, you can't, no, we're not going to send you on the next um, expedition to Mars or the first expedition to Mars because you're a girl or because you're not qualified or any of those kinds of things. So that's kind of where my... Um, you know, what I would like to change. I mean, I think it's massive, but that's what I, I, I don't want some some 10 year old to have that experience of saying, no, you can't go be an explorer and discover some new thing because we don't send teams of girls. Yeah. I think uh, when I reflect back that it's probably that I learned um, the importance of asking questions. And I think in my early career, I. I was reluctant to do that. 
because I had uh, set an expectation for myself that I should know the answers, you know, that, that if I was here, I should know, how, you know, what it was. Uh, and it took me a while to figure out how you, how you start to ask questions to really learn and grow from that. And, and just as important to know who to ask the question of, because quite often the, the fatal mistake can be that you ask the question of the wrong person, and that can lead you into places you, you know, really shouldn't go or don't want to go. But I, I think, you know, if I, if I look at something that I would say to people today is, you know, ha have confidence, feel comfortable to ask the questions, know who to ask, but make sure that you're prepared to ask lots of questions along the way because you'll find out a lot through that, so. And I would just add on that, ask for what you want. Earlier in my career, I was hesitant to ask for what I wanted, whether it be a raise, particular day off, a benefit, et cetera. But right now, I'm going to ask because my mantra is if you don't ask, you don't get. So it may be a no, but that's all right because at least I did make the ask. So with that said, any closing remarks from our panelists, closing thoughts? I love being at Ryerson, and I love being an academic leader here. I think it's been great. I've only been here just over two years, but it's been a very, they don't do this at other places. Or they don't do enough of it. They don't do it well, or they don't do it in an ad hoc, on an ad hoc way. So this is, um, this is good. And to have an open discussion like this, I think is very good. So, so Ryerson is a, a great place. We have our great panelists, and let's give them all a round of applause. And on Julia Hannesburg's behalf, thank you all for coming. We really appreciate you being here. Thank you for the questions that you asked. And if you have any other ideas for topics for future Women in Leadership Forums, please forward them our way to PNU. And we also would like to thank PNU for also planning this event as well. So enjoy the rest of your afternoon.